Okay, well today I'm um, very happy to have Edre Goins talking in this series of talks on Bailey Maps and Hurwitz spaces. And he's gonna be talking about critical points in Troido Bailey Maps. So Edre, um, take it away. Oh, and is it okay for us to video this talk from you? Um, yep, you do have my permission. Oh, thank you. Well, go ahead. Okay, well, good morning, everyone. I guess good afternoon to others. Thanks very much for coming. Um, yeah, and also I wanna thank the organizers really for a wonderful idea for putting together this online seminar. Um, Belly Maps and Descend Alphonse is something that I personally have been interested in for a while, but it's certainly difficult to find like a lot of really good places to kind of introduce the concepts and understand what's happening. So I think that this is a really great idea for the community at large. Um, I'm going to try to watch the chat window in case you do have any questions, so definitely feel free to kind of um, put things out there. Um, since it is a very hard act to follow John Voigt, I'm going to sort of take his lead and break this talk up into two parts. So for the first half, I want to review some very general ideas about uh, belly maps and the send on phones and monodromy groups and maybe say a little bit behind why this Vanches seminar is based on belly maps and Herbert spaces. So where does the Herbert's come in in all of this? Then for the second half, I want to talk about some work I was doing with my undergraduates this past summer. So some brand new ideas, um, hopefully some things that you'll find to be very interesting. So let me also say that I've sent my slides to, to Drew Sutherland. So if you would like a copy of these slides, certainly feel free to reach out to him. So these will all be available. Um, let me first start by giving a shout out to my students from the summer. So we did Prime, Pomona Research and Mathematics Experience. We did this virtually over the eight weeks for this past summer. Everything was funded by the National Security Agency. I think that I may have some of the students that are on the call right now. Um, I definitely want to thank Alex Berrios, who is at Carleton College, and Rachel Davis, who's at Wisconsin. So I think Rachel's on the call right now, um, for helping me out to run a series of three research groups over the summer. More generally, we focused on branch covers of Riemann surfaces um, and more down to earth. We talked about um, models of modular curves, so specifically global minimal models. Also the idea of branch covers um, of elliptic curves. And specifically what I wanna talk about is what I did with my group. That is this really curious phenomenon of what happens when you have a belly map that has as its domain of definition an elliptic curve. Some weird things seem to happen there and we were able to come up with some really nice results. So I wanna start with just a review more generally of this idea of belly maps and descent on fonts. Um, again, kind of based off of what John Voigt talked about a couple of weeks ago to kick off the seminar. I'm going to use the following diagram to help um, really organize what I'm going to say here a little bit. I want to spend some time talking about these four different objects and explain how they're all related. Belly pairs, descend on fonts, degree sequences, and monodromy triples. So let me start with just the general idea that kind of puts everything together into one slide. Let's say that we have a compact connected Riemann surface. I'll say in just a moment, what do I mean by those fancy words? Since we do have a compact connected Riemann surface, there's a classical theorem from complex analysis that basically says S is a curve. So simply put, what that means is I can think of S as being defined by a single polynomial equation, perhaps in two variables. And let's just say for the moment that maybe this polynomial has coefficients a, i, j in these variables x and y. Well, there's a theorem that says that s can be defined by such a polynomial equation, coefficients a, i, j, where the coefficients are algebraic numbers, that is that they are not transcendental. Um, if this is true, then there exists a rational function beta that has at most three critical values. Surprisingly, the converse of this is true. If there exists a rational function beta that has at most three critical values, then S can be defined by a polynomial equation where the coefficients are algebraic, where they're not transcendental. Um, so the second statement that I have here, that is if it can be defined where the algebraic coefficients are, sorry, where the coefficients are algebraic numbers, that is a theorem due to Bailey. And the converse of this, if we do have, um, 
such a function that has the most three critical values than the coefficients of algebraic. This is a theorem due to Andre Ve. So kind of the two and three, they're actually kind of out of order chronologically, but I just wanted to at least put all of this together onto one slide to say that this if and only if condition, that that is that the, that the coefficients aij are algebraic, if and only if you have a really nice rational function that we're going to use to motivate the concept of a belly pair. So the pair just means that our domain of definition is this compact connected Riemann surface. And we have this really nice function that has at most three critical values. Now, I threw out these fancy phrases, um, compact, connected, Riemann surface. Let me just say that in a very down to earth way, we actually do see these so-called compact connected Riemann surfaces on a daily basis. Here are three that I have here on the screen. So we have the sphere, the so-called Riemann sphere, we have the torus, and then here at the bottom, this green object is like a three-hole torus. So there's a nice theorem that says if you have a compact connected Riemann surface, then you can basically classify these by the so-called genus. This just tells you how many holes you have for your surface. I want to go over a couple of examples just to kind of emphasize that we do not only want to focus on the geometry, we also want to focus a little bit more on the algebra. So some polynomials we'll try to write down in just a moment. First, P1 of C, which I'll just denote as like the extended complex line. Here we just mean the complex numbers. And we'll compactify by throwing in one more point without being rigorous, I'll just say it's the point at infinity. This here actually looks like the sphere. And the way that we can see this is using stereographic projection. I'm not going to worry about the details that you see here on the screen, but the idea is that if you have a complex number z, you can use that to now draw a point uvw that's here on the sphere. And putting all of this together, that is thinking of p1 of c as the sphere, we're going to say p1 of c is the Riemann sphere, right? So this is an idea of a compact connected Riemann surface. There's another example I want to mention, that is here we have the torus. And let's say perhaps if we have maybe something like the complex numbers modulo a lattice, then I can think of C mod the lattice as the same as the torus. The rough idea is that if we have C mod the lattice, we can almost think of this as like a collection of circles going in two different directions. You can actually see this with the blue object at the bottom of the screen. We have kind of the circles going around this angle theta, and then other circles going around this other angle phi. And putting the two of these together, we can now kind of draw this thing here as we wrap things around to see that we have things on the torus. Right? Another way to say this geometrically is I can maybe say have a sheet of paper. I can think of the theta perhaps as I go from left to right. I kind of connect the edges together. That's where I kind of identify 0 and 2 pi. And so then now this sheet of paper becomes a cylinder. And now if I kind of connect the edges of the paper, this might be say the top and bottom of the cylinder that corresponds to the angle phi, that allows me to wrap the cylinder around here to form a torus. So I can think of the torus here as another example of a compact connected Riemann surface. So again, there are ways that we can really make all of this very down to earth. Now, I've mentioned this idea of a belly map. Remember that we have this domain of definition, compact connected Riemann surface. We want to make sure that we have a really nice function that has at most three critical values, which we'll just denote for the moment as 0, 1, infinity. We can use this to come up with an object, something we can draw on the surface that we'll call a descend on form. And I'll just say, without really going into details, that what this really means is we have a bipartite graph, really a graph that we have the vertices as being one of two colors that we can construct in the following way. Remember that we really want to take a look at 0, 1, infinity, so our critical values. So let's just arbitrarily pick two of those three. We can say 0 and 1. We'll denote the inverse image of 0. These will be points on our Riemann surface. We'll call those black vertices. Inverse image of 1. These will be points in our Riemann surface. We'll call these the red vertices. And then as we go between 0 and 1, these will be edges really on our Riemann surface. And those will be the edges that will allow us to define our bipartite graph. So we'll just simply call this a descend on font, which is just friends for children's drawing. Now, I want to go over just a couple of examples of what some of these will look like. So here in the slide, you see we have the Riemann sphere. Remember, I can also think of this as P1 of C, so the complex numbers. And we'll compactify 
by having infinity. More or less, I can think of infinity here as the North Pole, if you will, of these yellow Riemann spheres. Here, my beta of z are examples of belly maps. So remember that they have critical values at 0, 1, infinity. If I take a look at the inverse image of 0, those will be the black vertices. The inverse image of 1 will be the red vertices. And if I go between 0 and 1, the inverse image of that segment will now be these edges that I've colored here in blue. So I think that last uh, couple, last our seminar, John Voigt mentioned what happens here kind of with the icosahedron. That's basically the lower right hand belly map that you see here on your screen. So there's just like this very beautiful symmetry that you have here with these belly maps. And you have these very nice symmetric types of drawings. I have these here because these are actually the examples of the platonic solids. And what's actually really nice is even Klein realized this, that the platonic solids you actually get very nicely kind of coming from these various objects. There's something deeper here happening with modular curves. And if anyone's interested, then I'm happy to say a little bit more about this later. So that's number two. So I've mentioned belly maps. I've mentioned descend on fonts. Let me go to number three, which is the idea of degree sequences. So I've mentioned that if we have a belly map, the critical values are 0, 1, infinity. So let's take a look at the pre-images of 0, 1, infinity. Remember, the pre-images of 1 would be our black vertices. Pre-images of 1 would be the red vertices. And let's say for the moment that the pre-image of infinity, let's just call that f. This is actually will be the midpoints of the faces of our graphs. The ramification indices will be the E sub P's, and I'll try to give a geometric interpretation of what those are in just a moment. So by a degree sequence, I mean a multi-set of multi-sets, so I don't care about whether the numbers repeat and I don't really care about the order, will be just the ramification indices for the pre-images of zero, one, and infinity. So this is just some kind of numerical criteria. It's just gonna be some collection of positive integers that I'm going to write down. Well, if we have a belly map, we can draw this descend on font. We can draw this graph. The ramification indices, at least corresponding to the black vertices and the red vertices, are just the number of edges coming out of those vertices. So there's a nice way you can read off these ramification indices directly from the descend on font. If you sum over the ramification indices, so that is if I sum over the E sub P's, for the black vertices, or let's say even some over the E sub P's for the red vertices, it turns out that that's the degree of the belly map. This is essentially the same thing as the degree sum formula that you see coming from combinatorics. Finally, there's this curious formula that allows us to say that the genus of our Riemann surface can be determined directly from all of this numerical criteria. So what I mean by that is, pretty much from the Hurwitz genus formula, you actually see that the degree of your belly map is the number of black vertices plus the number of red vertices plus the number of faces plus some kind of fudge factor, this 2G minus 2. Again, here, G will be the genus of our Riemann surface. So putting all of this together, if you happen to know the degree, and you happen to know the number of red vertices, black vertices, and faces, you can actually use this to determine the genus. So there's a lot of information you can read off here from this degree sequence, just from this collection of integers. I am interested in the converse of all of this. So that is, let's say someone just gives you this degree sequence, this collection of integers. So all that we know is that we have a collection of integers, and let's say that they satisfy some of the numerical criteria that I said before. So things like the sum of the E sub P's is N, so N should be the degree of something. And if I count the number of black, the number of red, the number of faces, G plus 2G minus 2, there should also be this degree N. I'd like to know, when is this degree sequence the degree sequence of some belly map? So actually, Adolf Hurwitz was interested in the same question. And essentially, he came up with an answer that goes as follows. This degree sequence is the degree sequence of some belly map if and only if you can find three permutations 
which are right here is S0, sigma zero, sigma one, and sigma infinity, that satisfy a few properties. The rough idea is that if you take a look at the cycle decomposition of sigma zero, one, and infinity, they should correspond exactly to the degree sequences. And I'll try to give an example in just a moment. You also want a couple of other properties that says the product of the three should be the trivial permutation, and it should generate a transitive subgroup sitting inside of SN. This has something to do with the Riemann surface being connected. Putting all of this together, we now see that there is a way you can translate this numerical criteria, just having the sequence of integers, this degree sequence, into the construction of a belly map. Eventually, this gets into the idea of Herbert spaces, which I'm not going to even attempt to talk about today. But this, again, allows us to say we can go from this numerical criteria, just writing down integers, to actually knowing that a really nice map does exist. The group generated by this monodromy triple is, of course, what we're going to call the monodromy group. Now, I wanted to spend a couple of minutes and actually go over some examples of what's really happening here, because there really is a nice geometric interpretation. So perhaps for all of for some of you here who maybe don't really have an interest in trying to write down any of these examples of belly maps and just want to take a look at the graphs, at the descend on fonts, there really is a nice simple way of seeing what the monodromy group is. So first, let me say that you can use this proposition to get an idea of how many belly maps there are associated to a degree sequence. Let me give you this example here of this degree sequence, one, four, one, four, and five. And this corresponds to n is equal to five. I claim just by looking at these numbers that there have to be at least two belly pairs associated to this. So remember that the sequence of integers here, one, four, one, four, five, that just satisfies all this numerical criteria that, that I have before. So you can check in this case that G equals one, that the genus is equal to one. Well, according to Herbert's theorem, if there is a belly map associated to this degree sequence, I need to find permutations in S5 that have the right cycle decomposition. So you see here that sigma, if I choose this to be two, one, three, five, four, that has cycle type one, four. Sigma one, if I choose that to be four, one, three, five, two, that is cycle type one, four. And sigma infinity, if I choose that to be one, two, three, four, five, that is cycle type five. These have the right cycle type. Also the product of the three, sigma zero, circle sigma one, circle sigma infinity is the trivial permutation and they generate a transitive subgroup of S5. Turns out they actually generate all of S5. So this degree sequence does correspond to at least one belly map, right? That's what Herbert's theorem says. Here's what's surprising. This sigma zero one infinity isn't the only way to write down kind of a realization of this degree sequence as a belly map. On the upper right-hand part of your screen, you can see here's another way to write down sigma zero, one infinity, right? Three, one, two, five, four, five, one, two, four, three, and again, one, two, three, four, five. Same properties as before. The cycle type is the same. The product is the trivial permutation. But in this case, the group generated by them is the transitive subgroup, which is actually the Frobenius group of order 20. Different groups which means that we must have at least two different belly pairs. So the cool thing here is just by looking at this numerical criteria, I can use a little bit of group theory and I already know there are at least two belly pairs associated to this degree sequence. All right, so this is kind of the cool thing that we actually are working with monodromy groups, but we're just putting everything in terms of this numerical sequence, one, four, one, four, five. Similarly, you can use Herbert's theorem to know when a belly map cannot exist. So here at the bottom of the screen, I have an example of a degree sequence, one, one, two, two, six, and six. This corresponds to degree six in genus one. And you can check that there are no belly pairs associated to this, right? The way you simply do this is you just kind of run through all your permutations, sigma zero, one, infinity, take a look at those that have the right cycle type, 
You want the product here to be the identity. And if you run through, you just realize none exist. It's, it's not possible. So again, Herbert's theorem is a really nice way of just kind of asking, does a map exist? Now, I want to give a different way of thinking about what is monodromy by going back to the descend of faults. Here are a couple of examples where I'm going to explain how to write down the monodromy directly from the descent. Here at the upper right hand part of your screen, you actually have a descend on font that is of degree two. All that I say is that this here corresponds to a belly map of degree two, it's actually beta of z is equal to z squared. But here you can see that I have one black vertex, two white vertices. And so I can read off the degree sequence from this. Really, one way you can do this is you just kind of arbitrarily label the edges. In this case, I just chose one label, called it one, sorry, one edge, called that one, the other edge, called that two. And now I can read off my degree sequence as follows. There's one black vertex that has two edges coming out of it. So that should have degree two. I have two white vertices. They each have one edge coming out of it. So my degree sequence there will be one, one. I'm not gonna worry about what's happening with the faces for the moment. I'll say that there turns out that the degree sequence is just two. So my degree sequence now for the whole descent, it's two, one, one, two. I can go even further. I can also read off the monodromy group. Um, I think John Voigt mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. If you have a graph like this, all you really have to do is just read around the vertices going counterclockwise. So for example, if I start at the black vertex, and if I walk around counterclockwise and read off the numbers for the edges, then I see, for example, the black vertex should correspond to the cycle one, two. If I'm looking at each of the white vertices, and if I walk around counterclockwise, there I actually see that I only have just one by itself and then two by itself. So that's how you can read off sigma zero, sigma one. Let me go to the one in the lower right, because it turns out that this is a belly map of degree three. It's actually b of z is equal to z cubed. Same thing, I can try to read off the monodromy group. I have the one black vertex in the middle. I'm gonna walk around counterclockwise, kind of count off the edges. You see here I have one, goes to three, goes to two, goes back to one. So the sigma zero in this case is the three cycle, one, three, two. So sometimes people in graph theory call this the cartographic group, right? So there is a way you can actually read off the monodromy group directly from the graph. Again, you have a bipartite graph. This will have n edges. Remember that the number of edges is the degree of your belly map. You now just arbitrarily label the edges one through n, doesn't matter how you do this. And you can read off the monodromy triple, sigma zero, one, and infinity by just walking around the vertices counterclockwise and just read off the cycle types that you have. So again, in graph theory, they call this the cartographic group. So, you know, really for us though, we're gonna call this monodromy group. Turns out that these are examples of genus zero and you can actually do the same thing for genus one. So I'm not gonna worry about trying to go through all the details here, but you can kind of see here, remember how I said earlier, if we're dealing with genus one, we actually have a torus. And by the torus, you really have a flat sheet of paper. We'll identify the left and right edges, identify the top and bottom edges, sort of wrap everything around to be a cylinder. So that's what we've done here. Top and bottom are identified, left and right are identified. You can do the same thing as before. You see you have two black vertices. If I read going around one of the black vertices, I have two by itself. If I read around the other black vertex, that goes one to three, to five, to four, back to one. So you can see here that I do have the cycle type one, four. Right. So this, again, just allows us to really see the monodromy just by writing down the descend of thumb. I do have links here to LMFDB, which I'm gonna say a little bit about in just a moment, but this is just saying that here's a really nice way you can go from the um, belly map, so I should say the descend on font to the monodromy group. So I tried to say a little bit about 
these four, belly pairs, descend on fonts, degree sequences, and monodromy triples. Let me say that I've kind of cheated a little bit here. It turns out that for three of these four, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence, right? If you have a belly pair, there is a unique descend on font associated to that. Similarly, if you have a descend on font, there's a unique belly pair. Same thing is actually true for the monodromy triples. If you have a monodromy triple, up to simultaneous conjugation, which I'm not really going to talk about here, then there's a unique descend on font. And corresponding, if there's a um, descend on font, then there's going to be a unique monodromy triple. Again, up to simultaneous conjugation, because remember what I said earlier about how you can label the edges however you want. And if you choose a different labeling from what I choose, it turns out that it's the same triple, but you just may have to kind of conjugate the three of them to make sure that it all makes sense. There isn't really a one-to-one -one with the degree sequences. So I did mention earlier, some degree sequences have no belly pairs, and some degree sequences have more than one belly pair. So this diagram here isn't 100% correct. It just says that, roughly speaking, there is this idea of degree sequence that you can associate to the other three, but it isn't one-to-one. -one. So I don't want you to, to walk away kind of thinking that. So this is the first half. I did want to at least try to review some of these ideas of, of all four of these here. So maybe let me pause here just for a second. I'll catch my breath and see if you, you have any questions about how all four of these fit together. It sounds great, Edre. Uh -huh. Okay, great, great. Yeah, thanks. All right. Let's now move on to the second half here. I've said all of this really fancy stuff about descend on phones and belly maps and all these really fancy theorems. Let's make it down to earth and just ask, what about the torus? You know, I personally really love elliptic curves. I can't give a talk without at least talking about elliptic curves. So I want to kind of back up a little bit and say, what's really happening in this special case when G equals one? So just to kind of remind you, the case of G equals one is actually a really nice case that is associated to this concept of elliptic curves. Well, for those here that perhaps haven't really heard of elliptic curves, I'll just quickly remind you what's happening here. Let's take a look at an equation in this form, y squared plus a1xy plus a3y equals this x cubed plus a2x squared plus a4x plus a6. I'm assuming that these coefficients, a1 through a6, are complex numbers. We can make a substitution and place this cubic equation in the form capital Y squared is equal to capital X cubed plus capital A times capital X plus capital B, right? It's not very hard to do this. You kind of complete the square on the left-hand side and you make a clever substitution and kind of depresses the cubic and X on the right-hand side. So now that we have everything in terms of capital A and capital B, I will say that this expression defines an elliptic curve if this discriminant delta of E is non-zero. Simply put, I want 4a cubed plus 27b squared to not equal to zero. Remember that we're just working over the complex numbers here. Well, there are a few propositions I want to state that explain why we really like elliptic curves and why we make this weird, funny definition with the discriminant. First of all, at every point, on our cubic equation, we have a well-defined tangent line if and only if this discriminant delta of E does not equal zero. Second of all, if we have an elliptic curve, then the set of complex points on the curve, we may have to compactify by throwing in point infinity, but the set of complex points forms a torus. You can actually prove this by using the idea of elliptic logarithms. This is actually a very classical theorem in the theory of elliptic curves. It's actually something we'll see in a complex analysis class because it is so classical. And third, say that P and Q are two points, complex points on our curve. Let's denote P star Q as the third point of intersection. So we perhaps draw a line through P and Q. That's going to intersect our curve at a third point. Let's call that P star Q. That will allow us to actually turn the set of complex points into an abelian group. So let's define P plus Q as what happens when we draw this line, we find a point of intersection. Whatever that point is, we then intersect that 
with the line going through the point at infinity, and then we'll find this other point P plus Q. So it turns out that this operation, we typically call it the core tangent construction, allows us to say that the set of complex points forms an abelian group. So perhaps for the uninspired here, here's a quick graph to kind of say at least over the real numbers, this is what all of this looks like. So let's say we have the equation y squared is equal to x cubed minus 36x. So you can check the two points you have are p, which is 6 comma 0, right? That's the point on the x-axis. And q, let's pick this to be the point 12 comma 36. Here on the screen, you see in dark and the um, thickened black line, that is the set of points on our elliptic curve over the real numbers. So I'm going to be a little bit careful. Remember, over the complex numbers, is a torus, so things look weird. Over the real numbers, at least we can draw this. So here are x and y real numbers. Again, the thick and black line would be what you have for your elliptic curve, y squared is equal to x cubed minus 36x. The blue dots would be our points. So you can see here we have p and q. Let's draw a line through them. That's the red line. That will intersect at this point p star q, kind of at the upper right-hand part of your screen. We'll then draw a second line through the point at infinity. You can't see that point because it's kind of at infinity, but that's our green line. So that now will intersect the curve at this point in the lower right-hand part of your screen, which is P plus Q. You can see here that if you work this out, P plus Q is the point 18 comma negative 72. Uh, one thing I like to mention to undergraduates who maybe haven't seen this before, when I say P plus Q, I don't mean vector addition. Right, this is actually a really weird kind of operation that you get by drawing this red line and then drawing this green line. And then you have here um, this point P plus Q at the end. So again, remember that the theorem says this operation allows us to turn the set of complex points into an abelian group. So we have an elliptic curve. We know that we can talk about the set of complex points. We know that this forms a compact connected Riemann surface. So this is the idea now of um, saying that we have this, this really nice object that we can define maps on. But can we really define a belly map? So again, since my goal is to kind of make this very down to earth, let me just put this question out there. Say that we have an elliptic curve. And again, maybe we can write this in terms of this equation, y squared plus a1xy plus so on and so forth. Given a map beta, how do we check if it's a belly map? So here's kind of more or less like a simple way to do this. For a belly map, we need to know when we have critical values. But to have a critical value, we need the idea of a critical point. Intuitively, a critical point is kind of what you expect like over the over uh, in calculus, you want to say something like the derivative has to equal zero. Well, we have to be a little bit careful now because we are dealing with one variable. We're actually dealing with the function in two variables. So roughly speaking, we have to make sure that something like the Jacobian has to vanish. That's roughly the idea. So you can actually prove, and I will say that my summer students and I actually worked through this exercise this summer, that the set of critical points should be those points where the function f vanishes. That just means we have a point on the elliptic curve. And we want to make sure that this Jacobian determinant also equals 0. So here we have two equations we set equal to 0. There should be a finite number of points, x comma y. Those will give us back the set of critical points. And now we can compute the critical values as literally the values of the critical points. If there are at most three, let's call them Q0, Q1, and Q infinity, we can always compose with the Mobius transformation. You see this here at the very bottom of your screen to then say that the critical value should be 0, 1, infinity. So this here just gives a very nice concrete way of saying if somebody hands you an elliptic curve and a map beta, and you wanted to check, is it really a belly map? All you have to do is just first figure out the set of points where f vanishes. That means points on the elliptic curve. Set of points where the Jacobian determinant vanishes. That's a finite set of points. And then you just run through and just check that this really is the case. So just saying in a very down to earth way, there are ways you can check when you do have a so-called toroidal belly map. That is the belly map associated to an elliptic curve. 
So here's where I should back up to say that there is a website where people have actually done this for us. So definitely shout out to uh, John Boyd in particular, but certainly G7 and others that have really worked hard in putting together LMFDB. Um, I am very impressed by this website, but I was one of these grad students that really was stuck on trying to figure out how do you prove that an elliptic curve is modular? How do you actually compute the modular form to that? So shout out to William Stein, who definitely helped me with my thesis back when we were stuck trying to figure out how to do all of this. But I definitely want to thank all the people here on the call who have really worked hard putting together LMFDB, because now folks like me can kind of reap the fruits of their labor to really say, if we wanted to have examples of belly maps, we can go here to LMFDB and actually find examples. So I'm going to use a lot of the examples that are here in LMFDB to kind of talk for the rest of this talk about some weird phenomenon my students and I saw, and then some questions that we had moving forward. Here's my simple question. Say that we have a toroidal belly map. So remember that means we have an elliptic curve, set of complex points forms, a compact connected Riemann surface, the torus. We also have critical values, namely 0, 1, infinity. We can look at the inverse image of 0, 1, infinity. Those are basically the critical points. In my student's um, paper, we actually call these quasi-critical points, just because they're the points that map to critical values. I'm not going to worry about the details there today. What I'll just simply say is I'm looking at the inverse image of the critical values. And I want to ask, is there anything we can say about the points sitting in this set, these so-called quasi-critical points? This slide here kind of explains what we saw at the start of the summer. So I want to start with this motivating research question here at the top. Let's denote G as the preimage of the critical values. So remember, you can call these quasi-critical points. There really are the points on an elliptic curve that should map to the critical values. This contains the critical points, but there might be more points that are not critical. All that I care is that they map to the critical values. Using the group law on the elliptic curve, when does this set G form a group? That's the simple question. Now, you might think that this is a little bit of a weird question, but let me kind of walk you through three examples to kind of say that maybe there's something interesting happening here. First, let's consider this example, number one, of this elliptic curve, y squared is equal to x cubed plus one. And here we'll have our toroidal belly map, x comma y goes to y plus one over two. This map has degree three. You can check that its degree sequence is three, three, three. And if you actually figured out the quasi-critical points, again, just the inverse image of zero, one, infinity, there are exactly three points, zero minus one, zero plus one, and the point at infinity. And lo and behold, the inverse image of the critical values is cyclic of order three. So in this case, the quasi-critical points actually gives us back a group. Okay, so maybe we just got lucky. That's just one case where that worked. Let's try a second example. Let's consider the elliptic curve y squared is equal to x cubed minus x. And let's take a look at the belly map x comma y goes to x squared. This map has degree four. It has degree sequence four, two, two, and four. And in this case, we can compute the quasi-critical points. Again, just the inverse image of zero, one, infinity. And we actually find four points, and actually in this case, the quasi-critical points forms a group again. It's actually Z2 cross Z2. So here we have two examples where it seems like the answer to this main question at the beginning is yes, that the inverse image of the critical values does form a group. Let me give a third example to kind of say, well, this doesn't always happen. Let's take a look at the elliptic curve y squared is equal to x cubed plus x squared plus 16x plus 180. And here we have a belly map also of degree four, which I'm not going to worry about reading. In this case, the degree sequence is a little bit different. It's four, one, three, four. In this case, we have quasi-critical points. So again, I want quasi because I just want the inverse image 
a zero one infinity, I find these four points here. Turns out this is actually a general theorem you can prove that the number of points in G is the degree of the map. That follows directly from the Herbert's genius formula. It's not too hard to see that. So again, here G, inverse image of the critical values, has four points. That set G doesn't form a group, but all of the points here are torsion. So I can actually extend it by just a little bit by adding in a few more points. And I see that G is actually contained in Z mod 8Z. So again, G here doesn't form a group, but it is contained in a finite group. So with these three examples, it does seem like something weird is happening. So the answer to the main question at the top of the screen isn't always yes. So it doesn't always form a group, but there definitely seems to be something interesting happening here. So I gave this idea to my students over the summer, and we decided to kind of do some data mining in LMFDB just to see, are there other cases where this happens, exactly what's going on here? So instead of, cor of course, kind of just giving you the answer, just jumping to the end, let me kind of walk you through sort of our thought process and what we were seeing as we started to play around with the data. So here on this screen, you can actually see where we work through LMFDB to kind of see what's happening. Um, I believe, and I'm drawing a blank because I didn't put the numbers here on my slide, that there are 251 examples currently in LMFDB of belly maps that have genus one. So we decided to run through as many of those 251 as we could just to try to ask the question that I mentioned before. So of those, how many do we have it where the quasi-critical points, remember the inverse image is zero one infinity, does actually form a group? Well, we actually said maybe that wasn't, that was too much. So let's try to ask what happens when they're torsion and what's the group generated by those quasi-critical if they are torsion? So here you can see in the second column, we have the elliptic curves. The third columns are the belly maps. And the first column is the label from LMFDB. So again, of the 251, we really only had this set of examples that we found. There could be more, but it is only an eight week RU. So these are kind of the ones that we found to date. In the right hand column, you now see that those are examples where we realized that the quasi critical points were torsion and we looked at the group generated by them. So again, maybe the set G is not a group, but it could be that those points actually are torsion. So what's the smallest group generated by those torsion elements? So for example, at the very top, you can see the first three lines are examples one, two, and three, I just mentioned respectively. So the first two, G actually does form a group. And the third one, G doesn't form a group, but actually, everything in G is torsion, and the group generated by it has order eight. If G were a group, that would have order four, because remember that the number of elements in G is the degree, but in this case, it's order eight. So here's the table, and I can tell you that we stared at this table for several weeks. We didn't really see any patterns, so we couldn't really figure out things like, why is it that in some cases, the quasi-critical points form torsion, and in other cases, they did not. The ones where G isn't torsion, we just left off of this list, but these are ones where we define as torsion. Another set of questions we had was, can we predict the order of the torsion by looking at the degree of the map, maybe things like the ramification indices? And again, there, we didn't really see any pattern. Let's say, take a look at the ones of degree six, kind of in the middle of your screen. You can see here for this example, Z6, that means the G here forms a group. There's other examples like the one right below where G doesn't form a group, but the group generated by G is Z2 cross Z6. Again, here, degree six. But if you go right below that, six doesn't appear anymore. So see, even for degree six, we have points that have order two, order four. And there's other examples where we have points of order two and points of order eight. Again, everything here is degree six, so we couldn't see what was the pattern in this case. So again, there were weird things happening and we just couldn't really see 
what's really the order of all of these. So this is definitely part of an ongoing project, but I'm hoping that I'm kind of piquing your interest by saying there really is something interesting happening with these numbers here. Now we then tried to think a little bit, well, maybe if we really stare very closely at these examples, what about the cases where maybe we could say that it's the composition of two maps, right? So perhaps something like it's a map from an elliptic curve to P1, and then another map from P1 to P1, or maybe an elliptic curve to another elliptic curve, and then that elliptic curve down to P1. So that is, are there these so-called imprimitive maps? Is there a way we can maybe explain this by kind of factoring our belly map? We actually found a little bit more interesting work here, and that of those 14 examples that I showed on the last slide, here are a lot of examples where we actually saw the belly maps actually did factor which actually gave us some intuition kind of on where to go. So again, these are examples where the G here is still torsion, but the belly maps are in a very, very nice form that we could actually say that they have to factor in some way. Actually, it turns out that what I'm saying here on the screen is actually backwards. These are ones where it does not factor, but I wanna say where, where this is gonna help in just a moment. So, Again, we were trying to ask about what happens when we have our maps that do factor in some kind of way. So you can see here that we actually took the examples from the previous screen and we just said, well, the belly map should factor perhaps in some way. So for example, the phi on the previous screen maybe factors as beta composed with this other gamma here. So we actually knew that in some cases we could actually factor out the belly maps. So putting all of this together, this was our series of main results from the summer. So here at the top of the screen, of those 251 we looked at in LMFDB, we realized that there were six examples that answered the main question of the summer. That is six examples where G actually does form a group. So you may remember the first couple that I mentioned. So this Z3 here that has degree three, and then this Z2 cross Z2 that had degree four. And then what you see here on the screen, these are all of the ones that we could find where it seemed like things worked out really, really well. So again, the G here hits a group right on the nose. So we just wanted to know, are there any finitely many cases where this happens, or does this happen a lot more? We actually were able to prove this happens infinitely often. So here's our main result from the summer, and here's how we do this. Let's start with the toroidal belly pair. X here is a set of complex points on an elliptic curve. Phi is some belly map. Let's compose with an isogeny. Right, so we have a belly map that goes maybe from phi to P1. Let's take an isogeny that goes from E to X. And so now we have this composition that we'll call this beta. So again, just composing with an isogeny. Well, if RG, that is for our original toroidal belly pair, consists of torsion, then for any isogeny, the composition here will also give us back this gamma that also consists of just torsion. So if you start with critical values, critical points that are really nice, for any isogeny, you also get back a belly map where the critical points are really, really nice. Moreover, if you start with the belly map where your G here is a group, then if you compose with any isogeny, then there are infinitely many belly maps where your gamma here also forms a group. So simply put, if you take the six examples here at the top of your screen, remember that these are maps from some elliptic curve to P1, that's the belly map phi. If I take any of these and compose with any isogeny, then, the quasi-critical points you get will also form a group. So there are infinitely many toroidal belly pairs where the quasi-critical points form a group. Now, this really led us to kind of think for the future about a couple of different things. So one, we knew that this happened infinitely often, that we could write down lots of examples where quasi-critical points form a group. More generally, the quasi-critical points are torsion but we can only do it using this trick, right? This trick of you start with something where you know G here forms a group 
and just compose with an isogeny. Again, take any of the six here at the top of your screen, compose with an isogeny, you're good. But we wanted to know what about these six? So what if we start with a toroidal pair that is primitive? That is, it does not factor in terms of a couple of maps. Do we still have this phenomenon? So can we still say quadratic critical points forms a group, or can we still say in some cases that the quadratic critical points are torsion? Unfortunately, that's still an open question for us. We just simply knew that once we looked at the concept of we could factor things, then it made sense composed with an isogeny, life is good. But we definitely don't know whether we can do this without composing with an isogeny. So with that, I hope that I've kind of piqued your interest behind a lot of this. Um, certainly with the students, we have a lot of ideas of things that we'd like to look at in the future. Um, I showed a lot of pictures and a lot of graphs earlier. We're hoping at some point to kind of make a lot of the software freely available, even with the code that we tried to use over the summer in order to determine when we have these um, quasi critical points that are torsion or not. We actually had to do a lot of work in SAGE. So in particular, I want to thank William Stein for kind of answering um, a couple of embarrassing questions about how to do actually divisors when we're trying to compute various things. We love to extend a lot of this to remod surfaces of genus greater than two. Um, so far, I've just kind of talked a little bit about today what happens with the quasi critical points and what's going on there. I personally would love to be able to say more about kind of the descend on phones to monodromic groups and, and what have you. Um, and part of my ultimate dream is to upload a lot of this to LMFDB. So with that, um, I just want to thank a few people here um, for paying the bills. So Pomona College, NSA, some of this work was actually done um, under the National Science Foundation, especially through MSRI Up, and they certainly were funded by the Sloan Foundation. So with that, thanks for your time and attention. Well, thank you. Thank you, Ed Ray. Uh, so this would be a, a great time if anyone has any questions. Yeah, there's one question here in the chat, um, not a mathematical question. How does one plot the pictures of platonic solids, belly maps, for example? Um, that's something I've been kind of obsessed with for, I don't know, probably about eight years or so. I wrote code in Mathematica that does this, and it's not the greatest code. Simply put, what you can do is um, you first do everything over the complex numbers. And remember that we're trying to compute things like inverse image of zero, inverse image of one, inverse image of the line segment from zero to one, and then you just kind of plot everything out. Um, computers don't like line segment from zero to one, so you have to kind of think a little bit more carefully how do you do that. One way to do it is you kind of take the line segment from zero to one, you kind of chop it up into a whole bunch of points, and then you try your best to kind of plot all of these points. You have a lot of inverse images, you kind of plot everything back in Mathematica and then hope that it looks nice and smooth enough. There's another way to do this kind of using differential equations and some other things that I've been doing over the years. Um, but simply put, you just have to kind of think a little bit more carefully, how do you plot things if you want the inverse image of something? Uh, my hope is in the future that instead of trying to ask things by using things like implicit functions, you can maybe plot a lot of this directly by using hypergeometric functions. So simply put, hypergeometric functions give you a way to kind of explicitly write down these inverse images. So remember, you're trying to say something like a belly map goes from a Riemann surface to P1, but really to plot the stuff, you really want to go from P1 into the Riemann surface. So remember, P1 means you have the line segment from zero to one. So right now, I'm just doing this in a very ad hoc way. You just kind of implicitly solve these equations. You plot literally hundreds of thousands of points. You hope at the end of the day, it looks nice and smooth. I am hoping eventually to write code that does it in a really smooth way by just saying explicitly write down the functions that give you back the inverse images, hypergeometric, just plot it directly. So you should have some really nice, nice smooth graphs. Oh yeah, Edre, I had a, a question. Uh, you may have already answered this, but when you look at the LMFDB for toroidal Bailey maps over Q, um, is it expected that they're all known at this point and in there, or is it expected that there could be, you know, lots more? Um, I don't know if I'm the right person to say that. I definitely will um, kind of defer to Sam Chevion and 
um, John, if they wanted to speak up. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. I know that there are these theorems that say that there should be like, you know, only finitely many if you kind of take a look at the degree um, of, what is this? Um, the degree of the elliptic curve over the, I should say the degree of the minimal number field that's going to define your elliptic curve. But I honestly don't know. So I think I'm hoping maybe Sam might talk about that later when he's going to talk about computing building maps. Okay, thanks. Maybe I can ask you a question. Yes. So, um, so actually, well, maybe it's not so much of a question, but maybe it's something else. Maybe your students could look at. I was, I was wondering what if I mean, you're one way to say restate what we are doing with the torsion. We are um, finding finding examples where the inverse image of zero infinity for torsion points is saying you're you're trying to find examples where the points in the inverse image generate a, a, something of the smallest possible rank, which is zero. But I mean, maybe you could try to look at, at the opposite extreme, try to find try to find a belly, a toroidal belly map where the inverse image of zero, one, infinity, those points are as independent as possible. And I guess, I mean, I'm just thinking, I guess they can't be completely independent because if you pull back um, like the rational function, the, like the coordinate on the P1, then its divisor will be supported on those pre-images. So that'll give you a relation. And I guess like X minus one will also be another one. And, but yeah, but maybe it's maybe, I don't know. I haven't really, maybe that's the only one you would expect generically. I, I, actually, I, I, just, I, I just don't know, so. Yeah, yeah. So I, I can tell you, I didn't tell this to the students, but I, I was kind of thinking something along these lines when, when I first gave them the project. So um, on the one hand, Generically, it does seem that if you kind of like write down one of these belly maps and then you ask about the inverse image of zero one infinity, you do find points of infinite order. I didn't actually check, like, say, if you just ask about the smallest group generated by these, what's going to be the rank of that subgroup. Part of this is it actually is more difficult than it sounds to first actually write out what these quasi critical points are and then try to ask, are they torsion or not? We had to do some really nasty work and like trying to compute the divisors of these things over number fields and it, it got to be really, really horrendous. So that's one reason why actually there are other examples where there could be quasi critical is torsion, we just don't know. Because actually working over number fields to compute this is, is a little bit more subtle than, than it sounds. Um, another thing is, I think in a lot of these cases, there are ways you can explain this by essentially writing down, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, a V pairing on the elliptic curve. So a lot of these weird looking belly maps you actually get are exactly how you would like generate V pairings by looking at these certain maps that have these really nice divisors. And it's little things like if you take a look at, let's say like an isogeny between two elliptic curves and try to write down the V pairing associated to that, you basically have to write down like a, a belly map in order to do it. Like, you know, I'm kind of not being precise there, but that's one way in which these things come up. So I think we might be getting lucky in that a lot of the low degree maps we're looking at naturally come about by looking at the V pairings. But that's something I personally haven't looked at very closely. Just my gut feeling is there probably is something, something deeper happening there. Okay, thank you, Edward. Uh -huh. Yeah. So I will meet, um, oh, was there another question? Yeah, there, there was a quick question, or I guess maybe a comment that here John Boyd put. Um, yeah, in addition to the equivalences given by div beta and div beta minus one, there's also one coming from the differential. Um, yeah, I guess I, I have to think about that a little bit because we actually were using div beta and div beta minus one quite a bit to do a lot of what we're going to do this summer. maybe just one comment building on what you just said, Idra, it made me think of um, uh, Miller's algorithm for computing the Bay pairing and you get these Miller mm -hmm. functions that I can imagine leading to belly maps, but you could also look at uh, there are other pairings that are popular in cryptography like the Tate pairing, the Tate Lichtenbaum pairing, and you get functions out of those as well. There's just lots of different ways of cooking up divisors. Um, anyway, that might be source material for, for finding some interesting belly maps, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I haven't even thought of those. But yeah, yeah, thanks very much for that. That's certainly something to look at. Wonderful. Well, um, 
Uh, we will meet again on September 14th for the talk by um, Oslam Edger. And uh, before then, I just want to thank Edre once more for a wonderful talk. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.